Welcome to Victory. We are so excited that you're here in person and online. You guys awake? All right, all right. Hey, it's going to be a great time together as we worship the Lord. We're excited to be together in the name of Jesus. We're thankful for this place that we can gather. We're thankful for technology to meet online. So as you get yourself ready to worship, I just want to give you a couple of announcements. First thing that we always want to figure out ways to stay connected with each other. We've got email, we've got phones, we've got social media. I just want to encourage everybody to, to be part of um, the church through one way or another. Um, some of us aren't going out very much in public still, and I just want to encourage you to stay connected to your church. Um, use social media. It's an easy way. Check in with us on Instagram and Facebook at uh, Victory Anaheim and Atlanto David and, and drop us a line. Let us know how you're doing because we want to hear from you. Um, some dates coming up. The end of the month, we are doing a service project, and I want to invite you to be part of that service project, and it's going to be uh, a, a drive-through food distribution. And you, you need to sign up for it. So send us an email to info, info at victoryanaheim.org to get, uh, get all the specs on it. Look for the announcement in our weekly email and we'll help you have to pre-register to be part of it. Um, it's a drive-through event and we just want to bless people, needy people in our community. Uh, last time around, we were able to give people about 50 pounds of food some prayers and blessings and, and send people out in the name of Jesus. But we want to encourage you to be part of that at the end of the month. Lastly, Easter is coming. Easter is coming. April 4th is Easter. Let's make it a special day. Let's make it a wonderful time for God's people to be together and share in his goodness. I want to encourage you to be part of our, our Easter festivities. We're even having the day before a, a, a drive through uh, uh, meet up with um, uh, candy and, and, and eggs and meet the Easter Bunny. And that's going to be on that Saturday before. So lots going on and we want to encourage you to uh, get involved with it. So God bless you. Rise to your feet. Let's worship the Lord together.
God to be his church to be his people to be his children what a wonderful thing to be able to say what a peace providing thing to be able to say he is our Lord he is the great I am creator of all difference. <laughs> Did you guys hear anything I said? <laughs> All right, good, 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 good. So I won't start over again. I'll, I'll spare you. What a great thing it is to be able to say he is our Lord. But the amazing thing is that we have the ability through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to humbly say we are his people his children do me a favor and pause just for a second just a few short moments take that in we are his children as we ponder collectively ponder the miracle of being be able to be called a child of God or perhaps either here are out there seeking to become a child of God today. Oh, we pray so. We would ask that you join us in the next song, which wonderfully weaves the entire gospel, canvases it together, describing the entirety of the gospel. From start to finish, this canvas consists in this one song, our life before God, his death on the cross, his burial and his glorious resurrection. And life after receiving God comes next in the song. It lets us look at his never ending mercy, his boundless love, so once again, we would ask that you please join us as we sing of Jesus Christ, who is our living hope.
Amen. That was so good. Thank you, worship team. You can go ahead and take a seat for a minute. It's a time in our service where we want to go to the Lord with our giving. You know, giving is always one of those things that um, you, people have a love-hate relationship with because in the church, sometimes people go, well, I hate it when the, when the, when the pastor talks about giving. And then there, there's people who quietly give and they say, giving is a huge expression of my faith. And it's one of those things that you only know the meaning of giving. You only know how powerful it is if you exercise it and if you'll take that step. And so I want to encourage you to, to give back to God. And in our church, we practice the 10%, the tithe. And you can give in, in one of two ways. You can give in person here. We have the giving box in the back. And, and you can also do it online. And, and uh, our secure platform is at victoryanaheim.org slash donate. And you can set up your one-time giving or your ongoing giving. Take that, take that step of faith. And we encourage you to take the three-month tithe challenge and test God and see how it goes. Test God. He'll provide for you. He'll take care of you. Living off of 90% instead of living off of 100% is an act of faith. And the faithful know that God always provides. So God bless you as you give.
All right, it's good to be together, church. So we're, we're doing a series lately, and this series is the I Am Statements. The I Am Statements of Jesus. Jesus made nine statements in the book of John, all contained in the book of John. And this series focuses one week on each of the statements that he made. And these statements, they're, most of them are, are metaphors. Seven of them are metaphors. And, and two of them are declarations that point to Jesus as the way to life with God. And all of them are contained in the Gospel of John. These statements are an invitation to discover, to experience, and to take part in creating a future oriented in the very heart of God or that originated in the very heart of God. So looking to Jesus as the author and the finisher of our faith, we discover the basis for an unstoppable Christian life in what Jesus said about himself. So will you join me in, in a prayer as we, as we get started with this message called the resurrection and the life? Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time that we can gather as your people Thank you for what you're doing in the world and in the lives of your people and through your people. Lord, we expect, we expect that as people yield to you, that you bring power and glory and goodness into lives. And Lord, the world needs your power and your glory and your goodness right now. And Lord, I pray that we would be good representatives of your goodness and of your power and of your glory. And I pray that right now you help us to hear these words and receive these words as a gift, as a blessing, and as inspiration into our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So this message is called The Resurrection and the Life. The Resurrection and the Life. And what I'm going to do um, with the scriptures on this, I'm going to read a bunch of scriptures. So, so you follow along with me with these scriptures from John chapter 11. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the scriptures in three sections. And, and so I'm going to start off with, with uh, at verse 17 through verse 27. I'm just going to read it straight through. And then we'll unpackage some, some important parts of, of that passage. So I'm going to go ahead and begin with John 11, verse 17 through 27. Need to be there on the right page. Okay. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus was all, had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, verse 23, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, Though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the God, the Son of God who is coming into, who is coming into the world. So this, this experience from Jesus' life, this powerful experience, I, I think this statement of the nine may be the second most powerful of the nine. We'll save the most powerful for Easter. We'll save the most powerful for Easter. But, but, but this one, this one is the hinge of Christianity. This one, Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. Where there is death, I bring resurrection. Where there is no breathing, I bring life. Where there is deadness, where there is death, I bring power, glory, and life. 
And so, so, so this one right here is the very hinge of Christianity because, because if Jesus did not resurrect himself, then what are we doing here? All of, his, all of Christianity hinges on Jesus rising from the dead. And Jesus said right here, I am the resurrection. And, and here what we get in this first message, in this first one, we get Jesus giving us a precursor to Easter. He's given us a preview, just a little snapshot. But man, this is a good snapshot. This is a good snapshot. Almost as good as the real thing. Almost as good as the big day. And so, so um, what, what had happened was, was that Lazarus, one of Jesus' friends, not just some stranger, not just an acquaintance, but one of Jesus' close friends. He was one of his disciples, but not one of the twelve. And, and Lazarus was sick, and Jesus was away in another town, and Mary and Martha sent word to Jesus. They, they couldn't text him. They couldn't even send a mail carrier. They couldn't send FedEx or UPS to bring their package, to bring their letter. They had to send a person to go to Jesus and say, Jesus, your dear friend, our brother Lazarus, is very ill. Please come. Jesus, when he got the message, you can read. I'm not reading the whole chapter. That's earlier in the chapter, chapter 11 of, 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 of the book of John. But, but when Jesus got the word, he said to the other disciples who were with him, he said, I'm not going yet. Lazarus is very ill, but I'm not going yet. And he stayed another two days. And then two days later, he said to his disciples, Lazarus died. Lazarus is asleep. And he said, and he goes, but I'm going to go so I can wake him up. And the disciples, the disciples, they said, well, Lord, if he's asleep, when he's sick, it's good for him to be asleep. He's going to wake up. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. You don't get it. Lazarus is dead. And they said, oh, okay. And they said, but Jesus, remember, all the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, they want to kill you. They just tried to kill you. But Jesus said, because my time has not come, no one can take my life. And, 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 then, and, then, and then this was where Thomas, where Thomas said one of the bravest things he ever said that's recorded in Scripture. That's where Thomas had said to them, to, he, said, he said, well, well if, if Jesus is going to die, let's go with him. We'll die with him. Let's go. And so they went to Judea and they set out to go wake up Lazarus. And then we get when, he, when, he, when, when he's a ways off, he's not even in the town yet. Martha heard that he's coming. We just read this. Martha heard that he's coming and she runs out to him. And, and, and it, it, it doesn't say, you know, Martha doesn't, it doesn't say she gave him a hug. It doesn't say, say she, she, she went over and embraced him. It says, first thing is Martha showed up to him. She said, Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Why did you wait? Martha, like most people, saw death as finality. Death is final. I was reading a little bit from Sam Harris, who Sam Harris is, is a well-known atheist. He's one of the new atheists, they call him, because Sam Harris does, does, does he, he presents a, a view of the world that, that includes what, what many critics of atheism have, have, have come to, to, to be their biggest criticism of atheism, or one of them, is that there's, if, if there's no God, there's no morality. Because God is the standard of truth. And we receive our standard of truth and morality from God. So we look to God. And, and, and so it was C.S. Lewis who said, he said, look out in the world and you see a universal morality. People all over the world, it doesn't matter what country, what culture, Everyone would say, oh, a new life, a baby, that's a good thing. That's a beautiful thing. It doesn't matter. You don't have to translate to people and you don't have to say like, hey, listen, when, when uh, ladies, when you have a baby and the baby comes out of you, it's, it's a precious thing. 
every mama just knows and everybody in the family surrounds them and it's a beautiful thing. You don't have to be told. And you don't have to be told that it's wrong to steal. You don't have to be told it's wrong to tell a lie. And you don't have to be told it's wrong to take a life. And you don't have to be told it's wrong to take what does not belong to you. These are standards that are universal that you find in the world over. Without anybody teaching them, they just are. Because morality is, is, is set in the hearts of men and women. And if we receive it, if we, if we, if we obey it, then we follow it. But, but Sam Harris, I was reading from him this week, and he said about death, Thinking of death, he said, I teach my children how to value every day. He's one of the new atheists, and he believes that morality doesn't come from God, but that we create a standard of morality, and then and it's taught and perpetuated amongst ourselves. And, and, and so, so he said, I teach my children to value every day because, because there's no guarantee that you'll have a tomorrow and, and, and teach them to, to, to value every person in your life because you may never see that person again. You don't know when your day to die will come and we don't know what's on the other side. And I believe that there's nothing on the other side is what most atheists most atheist say. The finality of death the people that believe that, there's, that death is final are all over the world. But Christians, we believe something different about death. We believe something different. And that's what Jesus, with his interaction with, with, with Martha here, was about this very issue. Martha said, if you had come, if you had come, my brother would still be alive. Why didn't you come earlier, Jesus? Mar you know, if can be used to condemn. If can be used two different ways. It can speak of possibilities, but it can also speak of condemnation. And many times people use if to condemn others. Many times people use if to manipulate behavior. And look, that's what Martha did here. Martha, Martha was feeling the pain, the loss, the sadness of losing her brother to death. And she knew, she believed, she had seen Jesus' power. She knew that he had the power to heal Lazarus. But she didn't know and she didn't believe. She had no inkling that Jesus could raise Lazarus after he died. But you know, if you read earlier in the chapter, Jesus said, he said, I'm, he said to his 12, he said to the 12, I'm glad that Lazarus died and I wasn't there. Because, because what's about to happen, I'm doing this so you can believe and so you can experience the glory of God. Amen. And so, so Lazarus died. And, and, and Martha and her sister Mary are grieving. And all these other people are, are surrounding them with love. These two sisters that, 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 that they don't have husbands. It was them and their brother that lived together. And, and, and now their brother is dead. And so people surrounded them with love. So there are lots of people there that came around the, from the community. And, and, and Martha, her statement, if you had been here, was scolding Jesus. Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would still be alive. He's your friend. You loved him. If you had been here, he would be alive. She was disappointed with his behavior. She felt let down that he did not come sooner. And she intended to, 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 to make him feel her pain. Martha was putting Lazarus' blood on Jesus' hands. Lord, if you had been here, he would still be alive. But you can't put your pain on God. You can't blame God for your pain, for your suffering. You can't put manipulate God into feeling your pain for you. God will feel your pain out of compassion, 
But don't try to manipulate God. Don't try to blame God. Don't try to put your pain on God. You can't do that. You can't do that to God. God doesn't receive guilt because not, God is not guilty of your pain. You have to take ownership of your own pain and give that to God. Then give it to God. Take ownership of your own pain, then bring it to God. Lord, I can't bear this pain I'm experiencing. Yeah. Lord, I can't experience, I can't take this suffering that I'm going through. Lord, these circumstances, it's too hard for me to bear. Will you help me? Will you, t will you lift my burden? Will you walk with me, Jesus? And the Lord will go, yes, absolutely. I've never left you. I've been with you the whole time. The best posture that you can have toward loss and pain is to embrace it. It's your loss and it's your pain. The embracing of pain eventually turns into the letting go of fear. Because when you embrace every painful experience as yours, you become free from fearing any pain. You will get free from from, from the fear of pain. You will be free from the fear of loss if and only if you can embrace your pain as your own, your cross to bear, your pain to suffer through. You will come back stronger from the pain. Stronger than before. And so this is an important thing. This is one of the, one of the, the basics of Christianity that pain is one of the ways God forms us. And so our posture toward pain is always to receive it, even as a blessing. And that's important. Now in verse 23, Jesus responded to her. He said, he said Martha, Martha, your brother will rise again. Your brother will rise again. Though he's dead, he's about to live. And, and, and when life hands you circumstances that kill your spirit, some of us are walking around like the walking dead. We're like those zombies because, because we've lost some of our will to live because of what we've experienced. And, 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 and sometimes when we get into despair, that's what comes out of our mouths. I wish I was dead. I'm ready to die. I'm done living. I have nothing to live for. And, and that despair is your downfall. Because though there's breath flowing through your lungs, there's no life coming out of your body. And there's a lot of people that though they're walking around, they're dead. Their dreams are dead. Their desires are dead. They're numb because of the pain that they experienced. And Jesus has a message for you today. It's the same message that he gave to Martha that day when, she, when he said to her, your brother will rise again. You will rise again in Jesus. That's the message for today. And so in verse 23 through 25, this exchange of Jesus and Martha is one of the most significant personal conversations in Scripture. It's in the top five. This exchange that happens in verses 23 through 25 with, between Jesus and Martha is so powerful, but I'm going to summarize it for you where, where, where is what we already read it, but I'm going to give you a summary again. Jesus said to Martha, your brother will rise again. Martha said, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. See, part of the Jewish faith Believe that there's a day of resurrection coming when, when all the dead people will literally rise up out of their graves and live again. And, and so she said, I know that in that day, he will rise up and live again. But Jesus, his response to that when she said, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection and on the last day, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection. I am the life. Yes. Whoever believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Mm. 
Everyone who lives and believes in me, Jesus said, shall never die. And then he asked Martha, do you believe this? But Martha's answer, though it was truthful, it feels like one of those answers that you give to someone when they caught you and you don't want to be like you don't want to admit that they're right, and so you kind of go a different direction that is palatable. So, so like Martha, when he asked her, he said, do you believe this? Do you believe it? And her answer was, she said, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of, the God, the Son of God who is coming into the world. Do you see? She gave the answer she wanted to give. That's like a politician. That's what politicians do on every interview. When they're asked tough questions, they don't answer the question. They give the answer they want to give. And it, they direct it to some other topic. But when you do that, it's the same thing as lying. And lying is wrong universally. You break an oath, you break a commitment, you break a covenant, you break trust when you lie. Even the smallest lie, even to, to omit facts, is still to lie. So the smallest lie is a violation of a relationship. If you want to be a trustworthy person, then don't lie. Be truthful. And so it goes on. Jesus let her go. Even she, what she said was truthful. You're the Christ, the Son of God, who's coming into the world. She didn't say, I believe that you're the resurrection and you are the life and you have the power to raise up my brother. She didn't say that. So it goes on. Now, I'm going to read this next section from verses 28 through 37. So from John chapter 11, verses 28 through, through 37. Listen to this. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. Verse 31, when the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Sound familiar? When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, come and, Lord, come and see Verse 35, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? So let, let's unpackage this a little bit. This, this section I call the soul care. The soul care. Jesus cares for the soul the soul of, of, the, of the person is the essence of who we are. And, and, and when, in verse 28, when Mary heard that Jesus arrived, she quickly rose up and went to meet him. Remember, Mary, the sister of Martha and the sister of Lazarus, is also the same Mary, the same Mary that washed the feet of Jesus with her feet. The same Mary. This is the same Mary. She washed the feet of Jesus with her feet. What an act of humility. She, that, 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 this, that Mary would take her own hair. Can you imagine having the long hair and, 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 and pouring the ointment on Jesus' feet and kneeling down, kneeling down. Even kneeling is an act of humility. Kneeling to your knees is an act of humility. And, and she knelt down and, and she washed Jesus' feet. 
She poured the, 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 the expensive perfume on his feet and she washed his precious feet. And she got her hands and her, her own hair all over Jesus' feet. Why would she do that? Can you see the, the intimacy of a relationship that she had with Jesus to do such a thing? And, and, and now, when, when she heard that Jesus was coming, what did she do? It says, she got up. Remember, her sister came and whispered in her ear privately, hey, the teacher is here. The teacher is here, and he's asking for you. And it says that all these people who were with Mary in the house, consoling her, were nearby. And then Mary just gets up and abruptly goes when she hears that Jesus is here. Jesus is here. And she gets up and the people go, where is she going? And they follow her thinking she's going to go out to the tomb to weep. And she doesn't go to the tomb. She goes to Jesus. And as soon as she sees Jesus, what does she do? She gets on her knees again. She gets on her knees. Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would be alive. Jesus, why didn't you come earlier? Why? We needed you. You could have healed him. Why didn't you, Lord? Why? And Jesus, in this moment, Jesus is moved with compassion himself. Jesus isn't being manipulated into caring. Jesus could have come. He purposely didn't come. Remember, he waited two days on purpose. He said to the disciples, I'm waiting so that you can see the glory of God. I'm waiting so you can believe. Because something's going to go down in Bethany that's going to change your life. And so... Jesus, in that moment, when he's with Mary, I just, I, I, I got to say something about Mary's humility, that, that there's, in, in one sense, there are two kinds of people in the world. There are the humble and there are the arrogant. There's nothing else. You're either humble or you're arrogant when it comes to God. And there are plenty of humble people walking around and there are plenty of arrogant people walking around. When Jesus had his feet washed by Mary, when Jesus, when she fell at his feet, she ran out to him. And the people who were with her in the living room, they're like, what is she going out to see what's so important? Is she going to go weep for her brother? No, she went to bow at the feet of Jesus. Guys, Jesus was humble. The scriptures tell us that Jesus humbled himself, leaving the throne in heaven and became one of us and he became a servant. Humility is divinity. Humility is an act of divinity. Humility, the ability to be humble, is a divine trait from God because you're born in the image of God. You're meant to be humble because God is humble. Humility is not weakness. Humility is being meek, but humility is not weakness. It takes strength to be humble. It takes strength to bow at someone's feet. It takes strength to discipline yourself to be humble. And in fact, the scripture tells us, when we think about, about, about arrogance, arrogance is of the flesh. Satan rebelled against God in his arrogance. Adam rebelled against God so he could be like God. Samson fell because he was arrogant. This is why the scriptures say in Proverbs 16, 18, pride comes before, before what? Pride comes before a fall. Yes, yes. A plus. Good job, students. The posture of worship. Did you notice that the posture of worship is always humility? Yeah. 
We bow our knees in worship. We raise our hands in worship. We lift our voices. We look to the heavens. Every posture of worship is humility. If you cannot bow at the feet of Jesus, you're still arrogant. You have not truly given yourself over to Jesus. We also have Mary saddened by Jesus' tardiness and her making her own if statement. But can you feel the difference in Mary's if statement? Because she's bowing at his feet. She's hugging his feet and weeping. Lord, I wish you had been here. She didn't know. She didn't know he was the resurrection. She didn't know yet. Her life was about to be changed. She thought she knew Jesus, but she was about to learn that Jesus is the resurrection and Jesus is the life. When Jesus, in verse 33, when he saw that they're weeping, he was deeply moved and he was greatly troubled. Verse 35, Jesus wept. Jesus had compassion. People of God, people of God, listen to me. People of God, don't be arrogant in any way. Don't be arrogant toward anyone. Let go of your pride and be humble in the name of Jesus. Allow humility to pour out of yourself in the way you treat people. You know, I was talking with my good friend, John, yesterday. And he's telling me a story, and he works for the county, and he's, and he's at work. And, 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 and in, his, in, his, in his workplace, you know, they start work at 6 o'clock in the morning. Some of you didn't know that 6 o'clock comes around twice in a day. But they, he's already working at 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock. And, and it's common in their workplace it's common in their workplace for, for people to, to, to sit at their desk and do, read the paper or you know, just kind of have some, some quiet time on their own. Everyone's doing it in the office before they, they, they hit the ground running. And, and so, so John has this supervisor that John feels like his supervisor is out for him on many occasions. And John, he cracked open his Bible and he's, and he's reading. He's there at 6 o'clock. Everybody's working. They start work at 6 o'clock and, and he's there reading his Bible. And then everybody's reading something or doing something at their desk at 6 o'clock. And, and they start at 6.30. Like when they, all the, everybody hits the ground at 6.30. But everybody takes that first half hour and it's just part of the office culture. But on one particular day recently, John's boss came over over to him and he went right to John he said John what are you doing and John said oh well I'm just reading the scriptures I'm reading the, my Bible for a little while before I get going and his supervisor said John I told you not to read the Bible you need we start at six o'clock you're supposed to be working he calls him out in front of everybody else who's there at six o'clock and reading the newspaper or a book, or whatever else. But he calls out this one man for reading the Bible. And they have conversations they've had about the Bible. And then John silently stood there for a moment, and he had lots of things going on in his mind, seeing everybody around him. Every eye in the place is on John for what John's going to do next. Every eye. Every single eye is on John. And John, he closed his Bible. And he said, you know what? You're right. We start at 6 o'clock. I'm getting to work. And he went. He got out to work. Later on, the supervisor called him to his office, apologized for, his, for acting out. John believes that some people went to him some of, the, some of the other people said, you could be called out to HR for singling out him while everybody else is doing the same thing. You could get into problems yourself. Whatever it happened, John's answer was with humility. Amen. Nothing but humility. Nothing but humility. He goes, if I'm going to read the scripture at work, I'll get there at 530. Humility. A soft answer turns away wrath, the scripture tells us. Okay, I'm going to close this out on this last section. This is the proof. John 11, 38 through 44. John 11, 38 through 44. Starting at 38. 
This is called the proof. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead for how many days? Four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out in a loud voice, Say it with me, Lazarus, come out! The dead man, the man who had died, came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life, but now he proved it. He, was a li- he made the living example out of at Lazarus for what Jesus is. I am the resurrection, and I pour out my resurrection power into Lazarus. Words matter, but actions give proof. Your words need to be backed up by your actions. That's what Jesus teaches us. One of the things that Jesus teaches us. When he said, take away the stone, I want to point a couple of things out. The stone was in the way of what Jesus was about to do. Listen. When Jesus resurrects the dead, you don't want a stone in the way. You know what I'm saying? When Jesus brings the resurrection power into your life, you got to get the stones out of the way. You people aren't listening to me. Are you hearing me on this? You've got stones in your life and the resurrection is waiting for you. Your life needs to be resurrected from the dead. Some of you are the walking dead and it's time to raise up. You've been walking around dead because you've got forgotten dreams that you gave up on. But your dream is dead, but Jesus says, I am the resurrection. You, your faith needs to be resurrected. Your faith is hanging on by a little bit, a little string, a little thread. Your faith was dead, but in Christ, let it be alive today. You've lost your zeal for living, your zest for life, your, your desire to accomplish things in life. Maybe someone really close to you died and that changed everything for you. When a spouse dies, it kind of has that effect where you've got to decide, what am I going to do now? What does my life look like now? You have to reorient everything, don't you? Everything. Everything. Death of someone you love changes everything for sure. Do you know that the Bible tells us that our souls are dead without Christ? Our souls are dead. We're spiritually dead apart from God. So we have people again walking around with with breath flowing through their lungs and blood flowing through their veins. Their hearts still beating. But their spirits are dead. And, and, And the church exists to join God in His mission. His mission is to resurrect dead souls. Are you with me? The resurrection of Jesus This resurrection was a precursor to the resurrection 
of Jesus that wasn't so long off, not so far away. But guess what? The resurrection of Jesus is a precursor to the resurrection life you have in Christ. This is one of the greatest hopes of the Christians. This is why Christians are people of hope that believe in the future, that go to the future, that travel toward the future, that believe that God is going to do good things. We don't look for the end of the world. We look for, for, for when God returns and, the, and all things made new. We look for the renewal of all things. We look for a new heaven and a new earth. Doesn't mean, doesn't mean that that, that we, we anticipate the destruction of all things. We're not doomsday people. We're people of faith who believe. We're optimistic about the future because God is with us and he's given us the ability to create the future in his name. In his name. The finality of death can only be reversed by the power of Jesus in you. But Jesus never forces himself on you. So there are plenty of souls who will never experience the resurrection power because they don't choose to experience the resurrection power. People of God, I just want to point out one last thing. When Jesus lifted his eyes up, and he prayed to the Father. Did you notice his posture toward the Father? He said, Father, Father. And with humility, he said, I know that you hear me. And I'm saying this for everybody else, so they know that you hear me. And they know that I know that you hear me. And they know that you know that I know that you hear me. <laughs> they know. I want them to know that you and I are together in this. And the Father, the Son, and the Spirit brought power into, res into, into Lazarus' body and resurrected him. And when Jesus, when he, when they, he said, roll away that stone, take away that stone, move that stone. Martha, who said, remember, just a short while earlier, Martha, she said, oh yeah, I believe that you are the Christ and the one who is to come. But she answered what she wanted to answer. She didn't say, I believe that you are the resurrection. But right now, she showed that she didn't believe he was the resurrection. Because when he said, move that stone, she said, no, 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 don't move the stone. It's going to stink. Don't be moving that stone. Four days of death is rancid. Four days of death is awful. Four days of death is too much for the nose. But Jesus was about to pour out power, and he said, move that stone. And remember, people, you've got some things that are stones in your life that are keeping you from the resurrection that you need to experience, the resurrection power that you need to experience. You need to remove those stones and you need to experience the resurrection. You need to come out of the tomb and walk to new life in Christ. What's holding you back from what God has for you today? What's holding you back from saying yes, Jesus, today? What's holding you back from obeying Jesus every day? You don't just obey God when it's easy for you. You don't just obey what Jesus says when it's convenient for you. You obey Jesus in the hard days says everything about your faith. You obey Jesus when you disagree with God. It says everything about your faith. Amen. People of God, I want to close out this sermon. I just want to give us a, a minute to respond to God. And I want to ask you to join me in prayer. Just bow your heads, close your eyes. Let's just take a moment to respond to God. Because the Lord is working amongst us, and I, I believe that this message has something for you that you need to take away. And, 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 and there, there are those among us who some of us need to walk into, a walk away from death and walk into the resurrection. And so I want to give you the opportunity to do that right now. And then I want to give others the opportunity to, to, to put their faith in Jesus. But if it's you that you're among the walking dead. There's something that's holding you back from fully living with every head bowed and every eye closed. 
Something's keeping you from fully living the life that God has for you. Today's your day to turn it around. Whatever barrier is keeping you from the life that God wants you, picture that barrier. You know what it is. And allow yourself to be fully in submission to God. Allow yourself to, to bow at the feet of Jesus and say, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I want you in my life. And so if that's you, that there's something holding you back from fully living, just let God know right now in your own words, in the quietness of your heart, that you want to live, you want to trust him, and you want to enter the resurrection life and the resurrection power of his glory. Some of you may need to, you haven't put your faith in Jesus, but today's your day. You need to walk in new life. I just want to encourage you, there's a simple prayer, quick, a few, just a few seconds, to say yes to Jesus. Bow your head, close your eyes, and say yes. Yes, Jesus, I want you in my life. Yes, Jesus, I want to follow you. Yes, Jesus, I want to live in the resurrection power. I give my life to you, Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Join us in worship.
It's been good to be together, God's people. It's been good to be together. As we close out, I just want to say, if anybody put their faith in Jesus, make sure and send us an email because we want to journey with you. Send us an email to info at victoryanaheim.org because we want to put some resources in your hands to help you follow God. Following God is not a, following Jesus is not a, an individual sport. It's a team sport. And you got to make, you got to say yes. You got to put yourself on the line and then you join a community of God's people. And so I want to encourage you to be part of the community and let us um, come alongside you as you walk with Jesus. And I want to send you out with this blessing. God's people, if you've experienced the resurrection power of Jesus, (laughs) You're among the privileged. But that privilege isn't something that you hold for yourself. That privilege is something that you pour out for others to receive. The resurrection power of Jesus to live. There's a world that needs to experience it. There's a world that's fallen apart, that's crazy. There's lunacy all around us because the farther that people go from God the more irrational, the more insane their ideas sound, the farther you get from God. And so I want to encourage you to be a people that bring the resurrection power into the lives of, the, of those in your life. There are people that you know that need to experience Jesus' power of resurrection. God's people, go with that mission. Be that people. In Jesus' name. And join us once more as we sing.